Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell, and this is episode 16. Just want to wish everyone a happy holidays right now. We just celebrated the winter solstice. Got Christmas coming up in a couple days. Hanukkah just finished. Just want to wish everyone well right now. I know it's a very challenging and unusual winter and holiday season. And uh, I hope in some small, minuscule way, these conversations can provide a little bit of comfort, some light and inspiration for you during this time. Today's episode is with Daniel Simpson, who's the author of a new book, The Truth of Yoga. This is part of a series I'm doing uh, with interviews with authors and scholars of new books in the field of yoga studies. And so I was very happy to have Daniel on the podcast and uh, hope that you enjoy this episode. Daniel Simpson teaches courses on yoga history and philosophy at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and on teacher trainings at Tri Yoga in London. He earned a master's degree in traditions of yoga and meditation at SOAS, University of London, where he had the good fortune to study with some of the leading researchers in the field. He previously worked as a foreign correspondent, initially for Reuters, then the New York Times, after studying at Cambridge as an undergraduate. His interest in yoga developed in parallel, including frequent trips to India since the 1990s. Daniel's new book, the full title of which is The Truth of Yoga, A Comprehensive Guide to Yoga's History, Texts, Philosophy, and Practices, will be published on January 5th, 2021 by North Point Press. All right, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Daniel Simpson. All right. I am joined here today by Daniel Simpson. Daniel, welcome to the Yogic Studies podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Seth. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, it's a Monday morning here in Northern California. And uh, where are you tuning in from, Daniel? I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere, uh, northwest of Oxford. So uh, the north of the Cotswolds, for anyone who knows this part of the world. Um, it's now evening on a a very rainy day, so I'm hibernating basically. Mm, yeah, well, we're all doing quite a bit of hibernating, <laughs> these days, aren't we? We were just saying a little bit before we started recording. Um, kind of give us a little snapshot of how it's going over there in your area. Are, is everybody pretty pretty closed off, or are businesses shutting down again? Is this kind of a, a second wave over there, like we have here in California? I really don't know how many waves we're on to now, but um, you know where I live, there's not a lot to close. Uh, there, there's the village co-op, and uh, that'll stay open selling food. Um, but yeah, everywhere else, you know, London, where I would normally be going, you know, a couple times a week for work, is now totally off limits. You're not allowed to enter the place unless you've got you know very good justification. So I think the country is, um, you know, I guess confused. <laughs> really, we've had so many changes of rules, mm -hmm. and uh, to be honest, uh, not the best leadership. So it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult time. A lot of people making you know, very sudden adjustments to Christmas plans. I was going to go and see my parents for a few days. Now that's going to be a couple hours if I'm lucky, if they don't change the rules before Friday. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could understand what it's like to not have uh, clear leadership from the top and it must must be a, a real stretch of imagination for you yeah, required after yeah, the last four that's years over there. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And lack of clarity about information. And uh, no, it, it's been nothing short of uh, chaos and uh, just playing defense, you know, always a few steps behind and things, policies keep changing. And likewise, we've had Christmas plans, holiday plans that have to keep being canceled and changing. And it's a very challenging, stressful time all around, but it's also been uh, a very good time to hibernate, as you say, and to to write, to to do online courses, and to write. It's great, yeah, it's a, it's a great time to be into yoga philosophy. Let's be honest. I mean, if if, yeah. if, if this stuff is of any practical value, it you know it better, better come out now and prove itself. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's, there's there's not much to be said for it. And I think that's been the great joy for me this year is seeing you know both in terms of my own life um it's uh it's it, it's helped me ride some some waves i've had quite a few and uh, also just to to find new ways of connecting with people online and 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 seeing how 
you know, things that I was skeptical about in the past, you know, digital ways of coming together can, re can really forge community. And uh, so, you know, it makes me excited about the future in some ways, despite, you know, obviously my, my desire to get back in the room with other human beings. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's that been the, the, the experience and the case here at Yogic Studies this past year. I mean, we've had a huge upsurge in people joining online courses and the sense of community and the, the sentiments that we've received from people saying how these courses have got them through a really tough time. And that's been incredibly gratifying to be able to, to, to create those spaces and to uh, be able to offer that to people. And um, so, so Daniel, you know, we've, we've kind of crossed paths over the years. We've kind of, uh, I don't know, danced around one another at <laughs> workshops and conferences. Uh, I, yeah, I remember one wrong. particular, it's so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. This, this might, this might be like our first official meeting though, uh, together. I was about to say, yeah, you know, I remember, um, it must be about three years ago. It must've been in Boston at the, uh, the AAR conference and, uh, you yeah. know, you, you came up and said, let's have a coffee. And I was running around like a headless chicken. I just lost my scarf and it was freezing outside <laughs> and I was, was uh, trying to locate it. And by the time I did, then, then I, I couldn't find you again. And, oh, uh, three, that's right. Yeah. Three, three years have gone by, but, uh, we're finally getting that chat. That's right. Yeah. And uh, a lot has transpired since then, uh, no doubt. Uh, and including for you most recently, the the writing uh, launch of this book, The the Truth of Yoga. So first off, just congratulations uh, on you. the book. Um, when when does it come out? Uh, imminently. Yeah. Um perhaps even already before this 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 goes to air depending on how, how quickly it comes out the, the start of january 2021 so, oh, good. Uh, yeah it's been a been a, a long process in a way i guess i started the project way back then when i met you that was when i first had the idea i was flirting with applying to phd programs and in the end i threw my energies into this but also mm. had other things to do so it took a while to get it out as, as i guess you discover when you when you write a dissertation you know, the best of intentions always uh have other things coming along and just sort of getting in the way of them yes definitely that is the case uh including launching online uh teaching Indeed. platforms and <laughs> a business and all, all uh, kinds raising of a things. family other, other other such minor distractions uh, yeah. a family uh, a podcast um a number of distractions can come in the way unless we really safeguard that time and, and focus our attention which i think is what's required to, to to write a book such as this or to, or to produce a dissertation or anything you, you really do have to you know have this acogrita this kind of single focus on it don't you I would agree. Yeah. Um, somebody once said to me, you know, a lot of people can start projects, but it takes a certain kind of mindset to finish them. And uh, I've definitely seen that in my life. And my, my hard drive probably has about half a dozen books that I've started over the years. And uh, yeah, <laughs> thankfully, I saw this one through. I, I guess the uh, the intention behind it was clear enough that uh, you know it could carry itself forward. Because in the end, I think books write us to a certain extent. They're, they're sort of begging to come out. And uh, that's what that's what enables them to be shaped. Um, I found when I'm trying to wrestle ideas into a book form, if they they haven't been speaking to me, if I'm if I'm trying to summon them forth, they they don't quite behave the way I'd like them to. So this one this one definitely had its had a mind of its own. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of truth in there that you know I get book ideas all the time, but but do, you know when 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 do you actually uh, ha have the focus and and time and determination to see them through? So I want to talk to you a little bit about that more, your writing process uh, and how this actually came to be words on a page. But before we get there, just tell us a little bit more just about how the book project came together. And by way of doing so, maybe just give us a little bit of your background and your story of how you came to yoga. And I believe you did the MA program at SOAS, which kind of got you into the research and academia side. Correct. So Tell us, tell us a little bit about your story and then how that kind of gave birth to this book project. Well, I guess it's uh, quite similar to yours. Um, you know, I was a practitioner. I was, was interested in, in making sense of what it was I was doing. Um, I listened to your recent podcast with Mark Singleton. And, you know, obviously he was sharing that that had been his, his, his experience as well. And uh, being of a certain mindset, you know, he was drawn to study. And uh, like you, I, I read his book, Yoga Body, and... Uh, really just 
open my mind to a whole new way of engaging with the questions I had about what it was I was doing. Um, I didn't really know where to look for answers, to be honest. Uh, you know, thinking back now, 15 years or so ago, when I was you know, starting out as a yoga practitioner, I'd already had a career as a foreign correspondent that had gone rather off the rails <laughs> and getting into yoga practice had helped me get grounded. And, uh, you know, I really, I really wanted to understand what it was, what it was you know, all about, I suppose. Um, I could tell it was doing me good, but, uh, apart from, you know, this sort of general wellness language around uh, modern yoga, um, I didn't really have anything to hold on to. And when I started looking at old texts like the Yoga Sutra or the Bhagavad Gita, they, they were clearly, as you know, everybody finds out, not really describing what it was we were doing in a modern postural yoga class. And yet at the same time, they seemed to have some relevance. And I, I just wanted some help to bridge that gap. And uh, I wasn't sure where to turn. And I guess over the years, you know, I went and spent quite a lot of time in India and got a lot of traditional explanations. But I always felt like I was being... You know, presented one point of view or shown just one part of the picture and I guess what turned me on to scholarship was the idea that one could even be skeptical of the whole picture and start again and try and you know with with a very detached perspective uh, build up a you know a completely different picture in a way that's made of the same material but with with, with, with slightly different questions and priorities and over the years I've you know I've come to sort of I guess feel that that's that's not my path um i've got enormous respect for yoga scholars and i couldn't have written my book without the work that they do but uh, i guess my mindset has shifted more back to the practitioner and i guess i want to use what i've learned from uh, you know, dipping my toes into yoga scholarship and understanding you know the value of, of you know skeptical engagement and critical analysis really of, of some of these stories that the <laughs> one gets told that don't necessarily uh, have evidence to support them and at the same time you know really come back to my main priority of making you know spiritual wisdom accessible really i mean that's where these texts have come from they're you know, texts about the pursuit of uh, liberation from suffering um you know this is not a small matter and i think that's why people want to study them because <laughs> Yeah, you know, suffering is endemic to being alive to a certain extent, as various people much wiser than me have said. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how to try and, uh, you know, authentically, I guess, relate some of those insights to modern priorities. And uh, those are not the same as the priorities with which the texts were written. So I guess we need to do two things. First, clarify what's in the text. Second, clarify our priorities <laughs> and then you know, see how we're going to do some translation and uh, be honest about that and that's what my book's trying to do it's uh, an attempt to summarize what's in the major texts sort of influence yoga practice and some of the other factors that have shaped the evolution of yoga as it's changed and then really to present them as sort of building blocks that have been assembled into into different uh, structures over the centuries and to invite anyone who's reading to feel you know, in a way that we're free to do the same thing ourselves no no, no one's going to take you know the, the <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> the yoga sutra and uh well some might but uh there would be an ambitious one who's going to try and follow that through to kaivalya um so we're inevitably you know, taking some parts and leaving others behind um so i just i just think you know it's, it's, it's good to remind people that's okay but at the same time to also suggest that it's perhaps not okay to change what patanjali says call it what patanjali says and confuse people with that which mm. some yoga books have done over over the last few decades. Certainly. Uh, so you mentioned your background as a foreign correspondent and, and Indeed, you, yeah. you were a journalist for many years. And so it seems to me your your background as a as a writer, you know, you seem so you have some professional training as a as a writer before you was that before you even discovered yoga and and this research? Um I guess they kind of went hand in hand. Um I remember going to India for the first time in 1998, and at that time I had just been accepted onto the uh, the graduate trainee program at Reuters News Agency. So I was a sort of foreign correspondent in waiting, and uh, went off for a three month adventure in the Himalayas. Um, and at the start of that trip, I bought Iyengar's Light on Yoga. I'd never actually practiced any physical yoga at that point. I'd uh, made some fairly futile attempts to teach myself to meditate, and. Uh, I found myself, you know, hanging out in various places in which yoga was, you know, surrounding me, but I, I didn't really, didn't really know what it was. Um, 
as in there were some people teaching postural yoga classes on the one hand and there were also these strange semi-naked characters with dreadlocks sitting around fires who i found myself hanging out with and people talked about yoga in that context too and uh, so it was a strange word that seemed to have something to do with uh, this renouncer tradition that uh, was still alive in front of my eyes um, and uh, also you know it's part of this this foreign backpacker stretching scene with other people teaching five rhythms dance and tai chi and goodness knows what else and uh, so i dabbled a little bit but mm -hmm. i didn't really know how to make any sense of it and to be honest at that time i probably had more fun sitting around the fire smoking dope with the sadhus so i thought that was yoga <laughs> it took me a, a good half dozen years to to, to realize i was mistaken um, that mm -hmm. uh, the expanded consciousness that i was feeling was was really just getting high rather than <laughs> making some sort of spiritual progress and um, so later i ended up in a postural yoga class i guess uh, mm. you know, trying to try to reconcile these things but uh, at that time in the middle middle of that sorry just to go back to your original question i've been working abroad i've been in a stressful job but i uh, mm. had this interest in india and uh, it had been a, a very life-changing experience i then went back a couple of times to to do more of the same i went to the kumbh mela in 2001 spent a couple of weeks sitting around fires and uh, yeah i guess getting a more of a an understanding of of, of, of this living tradition of uh you know renunciate practice and uh, watching these 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 orders of, of sadhus go about their their holy baths um and and yet at the same time not really knowing how to integrate that into my life i was enjoying what i was learning but it didn't it didn't have any framework for me and, and that's i suppose later what i was trying to to reconcile that I'd seen something more than either yoga classes or ancient texts. I'd seen some living, breathing embodiment of something that that, that was totally other, and uh, that meant a lot more to me than, than than everything I'd been doing as a reporter, which was, yeah, I mean, it's a whole other story, but <laughs> it was it was quite eye-opening in in other ways. It got quite disillusioning at one point. I was working for the New York Times when they were basically enabling the invasion of Iraq, and uh, I, I kind of just decided that was enough and uh, and resigned and yeah, that was really what led to a journey that that took me into a yoga class and, and brought all these strands back together mm, wow well amazing to have that kind of uh clarity to to redirect your life uh which brought you to india which brought you to yoga and uh to the yogic studies podcast of course <laughs> i'll be honest seth i took so many wrong turns i ended up in the right direction but uh, <laughs> Uh, of, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a windy journey, this life. Um, there's a number of threads I wanted to pick up on and what you were saying, but um, what kind of initially um, brought me to ask you about your background in, in journalism reporting is, I think the first time I had encountered you is I read an article, I, I think this was something you wrote, tell me if I'm wrong, I think it was from uh, Yoga International, and it was an article talking about china as the next yeah. yoga superpower that's right yeah it's about 10 years ago now i think yeah. 2011 yeah and i actually quoted this article in my ma thesis which was about um kind of authenticity of yoga and yoga as a religion or not in the american context in particular in california looking at the encinitas yoga ah, yeah i remember reading about that yeah and um but this article when i was doing that research uh for that ma thesis it's always stuck with me what you wrote in that article and i've always wanted to ask you about it actually and um it was something like or, or what stuck with me from it um was you were looking at you know the rising numbers of yoga practitioners yoga teachers in china um but that wasn't what, what struck me was, oh, wow, look how many people are practicing in China. Something more subtle was going on that you picked up on, which was that when teachers were coming to China, even from India, you had Indian yoga teachers coming to China. The Chinese yoga, yoga practitioners were asking them, who did you study with in the United States? Yeah. what what is you know what yoga source and tradition are you drawing from that is they were locating the source of an authentic modern postural yoga let's say but in their minds just the source of yoga not in india not in the himalayas not in those you know uh duni fires of the sadhus but yeah. the yoga that they had come to know and love 
they recognize the great teachers of that, the, you know, the big names coming from America. And they wanted to know, even of the Indian yoga teachers, who did you study with in the States? Am I, am I remembering that correctly from? from um, it our... was, yeah, there, 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 there was definitely a lot of that, um, I guess, confusion, let's be honest about, about the origins of things. And uh, obviously the, 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 the representation of yoga on, on the global stage has in the last 50 years kind of been dominated by, by, by Westerners, although there are certain Indian teachers, if you're in the know, who, who you know, leap out of the woodwork. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so as people were getting into yoga, those were the images they were confronted with, whether it was through DVDs or, or looking online or you know, even, even books about yoga practice. Um, and I think, I mean, the context in which I was in China, uh, I, I went there to, to cover a visit by BKS Iyengar. He had been invited by uh, Chinese authorities um, as kind of a, a diplomatic stunt in some ways um, to, to uh, you know, build bridges between these two powers who've you know, repeatedly got close to going to war and uh, seem to be a little bit near that again. Um, and I guess it was you know, from the Chinese side, a, a way of trying to suggest that there were parallels between yoga practice and Tai Chi mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that there were perhaps also therefore uh, things to be learned from going to India and that uh, people who were getting into yoga in a big way in China um, could perhaps be encouraged to go and study in India. And as a result of this visit, you know, a lot of, a lot of people got into Iyengar yoga in, in China. I know um, several senior Iyengar uh, characters of various kinds. Uh, one very influential uh, senior student of Mr. Iyengar's Faik Biria became involved in training teachers in Beijing. Uh, and then there were some other you know, very advanced Chinese practitioners who spent a lot of time in India and slowly groups of Chinese started to come. I spent quite a lot of time in Rishikesh around that time. And uh, you know, large groups of Chinese would come and spend uh, you know, a week, two weeks there with a translator taking a class with a senior Ayanga teacher. A lot of them went to Pune and even, even bigger groups doing the same thing. And uh, so I think there was a conscious effort to try and you know, steer that process. But <laughs> attending this thing, it was, it was just like a, a an attempt to make a meeting where one didn't quite occur. I remember, I remember Miss Dianga sitting on stage and you know, he's a very impressive figure in many ways, but um, he seemed to just be disparaging this display of Tai Chi that was put on for his benefit mm. and um, suggesting that it, you know, it, it couldn't quite capture what, 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 what uh, the Indian yoga tradition could offer. Um, and I think, you know, he often had a, a story he would tell about things that involve movements couldn't quite lead to the same you know, clarity that uh, his, his precision of teaching could. And I just remember that jarring with me a bit. It was the point at which I was starting to question my, at that time, quite close involvement with, with the Iyengar yoga world. And uh, Did you uh, have a, a personal relationship with Iyengar? Did you study with him directly? Um, I mean, on that trip, there was a several several day workshop that he, he sort of facilitated with a dozen senior teachers, uh, had a number of them from, from the US. Uh, I'm trying to remember who was there. I think uh, mm -hmm. Manusa, Ma Manusa Manos and uh, Patricia Walden. Um, I think mm -hmm. was there. I don't know if I've remembered that correctly, but but anyway, there, there there were lots of these characters around, and I had studied with some senior Western teachers at that time. I'd wanted to go and study in India, but you had to log a certain number of years of Iyengar practice, and then then wait your turn for your appointment. So I'd gone there just because I didn't know if I would get to Pune before Mr. Iyengar died. <laughs> I was curious to meet him, so. I guess I resurrected my journalism career to uh, you know, find a way of paying for the plane ticket and very fortunately managed to sell that story. And it ended up not being a story about Iyengar at all. It was about this scene that I discovered when I, I rocked up in Huangzhou and there's, there's all these yoga practitioners and it's like a wild west of yoga. There's <laughs> this sports hall with 12, 1300 people in it. And, and outside there was uh, and all these stalls selling very strange products like uh, you know, yoga mats that were fluffy and a bit slippery, you know, a bit like a sort of uh, an oily substance used to make uh, things for you know, scrubbing, scrubbing your car windscreen or whatever. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very, very, very odd combinations of things. And, and, and yet there was this enormous enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And um, I could see very clearly that uh, somehow this, 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 was, this was booming and, and that, that was a much more interesting thing to talk about. And uh, so I, I used that you know, scene of, of him coming there to have this sort of 
you know, dialogue as a way of uh, actually seeing that you know, China was going to overtake the United States in terms of the number of people practicing yoga and could potentially be, you know, a bigger influence on the way that yoga was perceived around the world 20, 30 years hence. Um, yeah. Do we have any any sense of, is there, is there decent demographics that we have about yoga in China today? A very good question. I mean, I don't think we do necessarily. I mean, somebody must be collating that information. There was a, a Chinese edition of Yoga Journal that went through a couple of incarnations. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether they've done the same sort of research that Yoga Journal has, has funded in the US. Um, evidently, they will have done some market research, but uh, I think it's yeah, a, a, a lot of guessing was going on. It's an enormous country and uh, these things are very difficult to quantify, although the government must keep tabs on it quite closely because I think initially they were worried about yoga, um, having seen what had happened with things like Falun Gong, uh, opportunities for people to gather together under yeah, this sort of spiritual pretext and, and, and be viewed with suspicion as, as potentially subversive. And right, right. it seemed that yoga was being promoted because it didn't seem to have that effect. And again, that was another jarring thing for me, I suppose. At that time, I was very activist minded. My uh, flirtation with foreign corresponding and, and the way it had all ended, it, it, basically radicalized me i'd become an activist i, I was you know, very anti-war very anti-capitalist and uh strongly of the belief that yoga practice could somehow you know, support these 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 tendencies and to, to hear that the chinese found it so tame and unthreatening that they were happy to promote it was, was you know again quite disappointing to me at that stage um but it did seem that way it was uh, it was somehow you know it was it, it wasn't uh, viewed with the same suspicion and, and could be allied, I suppose, with a, a Confucian idea of, of uh, mm. you know, social harmony, keeping everybody, you know, sort of in, in, in good close interrelations, this sort of interconnectedness idea that sometimes we find in Western New Age presentations of yoga. So, yeah, it was all round. And that is I interesting. To... I hadn't thought of it from the kind of nationalist or political angle of th this notion that, well, it would be more convenient if yoga came from the United States rather than India, it's a <laughs> key competitor. Um, and so if a more secularized, fitness-oriented yoga that didn't have the religious connotations of, say, Hinduism, if that, that would be much more palatable in, in China, I would imagine. That's correct, yes. And yet at the same time, obviously, you know, take someone like Iyengar. I mean, he was teaching you know, Indian cricket players. He's, he's very well known as somebody who's making physical yoga accessible and, and not talking too much about philosophy. And that was the condition on which he was really sponsored to teach by um, you know, the local authorities in the United Kingdom in the 1960s. He was you know, allowed really to do what he did on the condition that he, he promised not to teach yoga philosophy. So although he talked more in later life about it, um, I guess, you know, in some ways he, he was a good choice, you know, that didn't go for Ramdev or, or somebody of that stripe. Mm, yeah, you know, my wife and I, we spent uh, a semester teaching English in China uh, in 2010, 11. Ah, around that time then, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was a pretty remote area of northeast China, Shaanxi, uh, very minimal English spoken, if, if any, really in the area. Very, very difficult and challenging for us to navigate as foreigners. Um, remarkable experience all around, um, but we will always remember this, that just in this little town where we lived, uh, there was a fitness center and we discovered they taught yoga classes there and it kind of became our little Chinese yoga studio. And these really interesting cultural experiences in this fitness center with all the mirrors set up and, you know, all of these um, Chinese housewives uh, who were, who were doing yoga. Um, and they had a couple different styles and sources, you know, some of them were doing, uh, Bikram hot yoga. Uh, one of the teachers seemed to be drawing on A.G. Mohan's, uh, uh, style of yoga, which was very interesting. And I learned that he had had a lot of influence of coming, coming to China. Um, but the, the enthusiasm for it was just really interesting to behold, but it also kind of struck us that. Uh, despite our language barriers, there was a cert certain universal language to these postures of modern yoga that we could kind of all participate in. Um, and so that's something I had always thought about, too, how the postures themselves uh, across culture, you know, this is something that is uh, 
become more pronounced as yoga is modernized and globalized that you can step into a studio in Shanghai or in, you know, in Paris, in London, in California, um, and you can kind of experience that same sort of thing. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Um, I think in some ways, uh, as a practitioner, I found that enormously empowering. I used to travel a lot for work, I mean, both as a foreign correspondent initially, but then the various things I did to make ends meet uh, before I, I found a way to, <laughs> to study yoga and, and turn that into my job. Um, I, I've, I've, I've always taken advantage of the fact that I like to travel. I can find things out at short notice and, and I would rock up in these strange cities and, and want to take a yoga class. And I wouldn't necessarily speak the language. And I still found I could follow along. I mean, especially when it was in, in the Iyengar method where I started out. You know, I was so used to this blizzard of instructions that gets translated into different languages that even if I couldn't get the vocabulary, I, I had some sense of what would be expected of me. So I could, could put on a show of following, the, following what was being said. Um, but I've been, I've been really impressed with the, the dedication of, of uh, some of the Chinese students I saw over the time I spent in India. Um, and a lot of it actually revealed itself in, 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 in postural performance. I remember the, one of the teachers I studied with in Northern India, uh, a Swiss woman who, who goes by the name Usha Devi, uh, she sometimes cracked jokes, you know, saying that they had particularly malleable bodies and therefore, you know, we're, we're a step ahead and we shouldn't think that just because they could make these shapes well, some of the, the young, you know, very bendy women who were coming into the class. Uh, Usha uh, Devi, is, she's, she's in Rishikesh, is that right? She is, yes. Yeah, I, yeah, did, right. I did the class with her once. Uh, <laughs> she's right, quite strict. Right on, the, right on the river there, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But at the same time, I was, I, I, you know, I've seen the sort of the use of that Iyengar method to discipline large groups of these people. I mean, I've seen teacher training photographs of you know, 400 people in a graduating class. And it's like a sort of Nuremberg rally of postural yoga, everybody making these angular shapes to perfection, uh, all dressed in you know, regulation bloomers and, and uh, little T-shirts. Uh, but it's it, it's pretty impressive. You know, they've mastered this stuff. And, and the the guy, Faik Birria, who was who was initially involved in a lot of the teacher training there, um, yeah, he's a he's a pretty hard taskmaster. Uh, make, make, makes Usha look quite mellow in some ways. Mm -hmm. So um, it's 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 really interesting to see that you know, it, it, if people really go for that, that it it can it can be mastered quite quickly, and that can percolate quite fast through the population. And uh, so I think that was the idea of that visit from my anger side. It was he was he was going to be you know the, the first one to open his shop over there, um, and and it seems to have worked to a certain extent. I mean I haven't kept tabs over the last ten years how many people are into what style of yoga. I have no idea to be honest. But uh, yeah. actually, in terms as you say of, of the postures being their own language, um, they're a way in, aren't they? And. Uh, that they, they are now a sort of universalized way into something that can go in many different directions from you know, toning your body to look good naked to you know, studying all sorts of uh, life-changing perspectives on things. <laughs> Those are, that is the range, isn't it? Right? <laughs> it does seem so. So, so Daniel, so uh, today, you know, as we're talking, there's, there's just tens of millions of practitioners who knows really what the actual number is of people who would self-identify as a, someone who practices yoga today from, from, from China to Brazil to uh, the Philippines, the, you know, the UK, United States, you name it. You know, I don't think you can really throw a dart on the map anywhere and not find a, a yoga shala somewhere today. So all of these people doing this thing called yoga, your mm -hmm. book is called The Truth of Yoga. So what, what is the truth of, of yoga? Um, and then how did, how did you settle on, on the title for, for a book like this? Well, there's, I guess there's a scholarly answer and there's, there's, there's a practical answer, really. I mean, the, 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 the scholarly answer is that there is no single truth of yoga. Obviously, there are so many different approaches to yoga, definitions of yoga, um, expressions of yoga that... Uh, to try and lump them all together as, as, as one coherent whole is, is not strictly speaking possible. Um, and yet from a practical point of view, I think it's, it, you know, it is possible to a certain extent to talk about something that they have in common and, and they're really revealing, ultimately we're not what we think. Um, and there is uh, 
a process by which we confuse ourselves and and and, and uh, there is therefore a means by which we can undo that and uh, I think I think that's the ultimate truth of yoga is there, 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 there is some respite from suffering and it consists of seeing beyond uh, an attachment to our ideas of who we are but uh, yeah ultimately though from the point of view of writing the book I suppose again there's, <laughs> there's the oddest answer and there's, there's, the, there's the, the sort of more highfalutin one um, I was looking for a title that, that uh, you know, really really said very clearly what it was I was trying to do which was to summarize as far as I could everything I've been exposed to in the previous couple of decades um, and I didn't want it to be unambitious I mean I really set myself the goal of trying to summarize everything I'd learned mm. um, and you know that's obviously <laughs> a fool's errand to a certain extent but uh, I, had a, I had as good a go as I can and um, uh, therefore you know I felt it deserved that sort of uh, wide-ranging title the other Sort of more honest answer is that while I was writing it, um, I had the working title in my mind of "Yoga Without the Bullshit," and uh, this seemed the, the, the more palatable way of turning that concept round um, because it did seem to me that the yoga traditions have, have have got you know their own histories and texts and practices associated with them, um, and a lot of what we see in modern yoga in the West is taking that and blending it with other things that don't really have that much to do with yoga, whether it's, you know, I don't know, um, I can, can name any number of, 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 of new age philosophies that, that get grafted onto the practice of yoga. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to sort of strip all that away and say, well, what, what, what's actually yogic as opposed to stuff that people like to talk about in the realm of wellness and self-improvement. And uh, so I've tried to zero in on those things. So to say this is, this is this is what the yoga traditions say about finding the truth that will set us free. You mentioned that this is an ambitious book, and it, and it is in terms of the scope, and the you know chronologically, the time period that is covered in a book like this, um, as well as trying to take inventory stock of all of the exciting and really pioneering research that's come out, uh, especially from the Hatha Yoga Project. Uh, uh, and trying to synthesize some of that. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, who is this book written for? What do you see as uh, the intended audience or reader for this book? Well, I've, I've, I've tried to make it as accessible as possible. So I've, I've, uh, I've covered, as you say, you know, chronologically a huge sweep and, and uh, conceptually as well. I mean, it goes from the earliest recorded history to, to the present day, effectively. Um, and that's broken down into roughly 100 chapters of you know, not much more than 500 words. So they're little blog length articles on the various themes that in you know, all sorts of different ways have been combined to make the different traditions of yoga. And therefore, I suppose I've written it for somebody like myself a few years ago who, who is a practitioner or a teacher of yoga who wants to have some reliable information to uh, to anchor themselves in while perhaps then going on to explore more deeply any of these particular paths so whether it's reading one of the texts in its entirety whether it's uh, immersing themselves in a particular uh, philosophical perspective uh, whether it's even studying with with a particular lineage um, it's it, it, it's a sort of bridge building exercise from that point of view to, to to be an entry point so i guess it's aimed at practitioners and teachers who want to inquire a little more and aren't quite sure where to look they've they've read enough to know that they'd like to read more but scholarly books are a little bit daunting so hopefully this can serve as a you know a bridge to being able to to delve into the vast amount of now you know open access publicly available scholarly literature that mm. uh, is, is hard to navigate if you if you've not read that much around the top the topics because mm. it assumes a lot of knowledge and and there's a whole load of information yeah, included there that, that most people don't need to engage with it's it's there for for the purposes of you know, scholarship really rather than, than than general readership um so i've tried to comb out a few of those nuggets that will make it a little bit easier to have some handholds so in a sense it'd be like you know i guess i see i see it as a way of helping people up the mountain rather than just giving them a map and pointing them in a direction and saying off you go which is you know, i guess the experience i've i've had when i've suggested to some of the people i, I teach that the, the, they read scholarly articles they end up coming back saying could we maybe gather together and have a have a little discussion group so that we know what on earth we're supposed to be getting from this because it's just it's heavy going um so 
I guess I found that out myself, you know, it's uh, to go back to one of your earlier questions, I didn't really answer in full. Um, after my time studying in India a lot, uh, I really wanted to, to integrate all these different um, bits and pieces I'd picked up. And that's why I applied to the master's program at SOAS mm -hmm. and spent, you know, I was very fortunate, spent a couple of years studying with some of these pioneering researchers we've, we've been alluding to, the, the, the team at the Hatha Yoga Project, Jim Mallinson was there teaching at that time. He just assembled the, the team, got the research grant together. So I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be able to yeah, he, he, he was <laughs> glean actually, all these insights. Yeah. He, he was actually teaching. Uh, he was, yeah. He, he, he taught, he taught uh, a whole semester of you know, yoga history. And so I, you know, I also did, uh, did a year of Sanskrit with him. Um, so mm -hmm. You know, I, was, I, was, I was really lucky and I guess from that time I had the sense that there's so much here that uh, needs to be more widely known and now you know through projects such as yours obviously it, it is filtering out in more accessible ways and it's it's really heartening in a way to see the authors of some of the articles that are difficult to make sense of putting together a four-part course to do exactly what I was saying you know is a helpful process but making that more accessible, providing some handholds, bringing it to life for people so that they do feel empowered to go and read on for themselves. And it, it's great. Everything's opening up. And you know, as time goes forward, more and more so. But still, people always come and say, what's the one book I should read if I really want to understand yoga history and philosophy? <laughs> and I don't, I don't have an answer for them. So I decided to write it. And yeah. therefore, you know, I mean, if I'm totally honest, I, 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 I would hope you know, people who run yoga teacher trainings uh, assign it as, as a good place to start. Mm. I mean, I've, I've drawn on lots of other people's work, I've referenced it, and if anybody wants to go deeper in any direction, there are some suggested texts to work with. But if you're just looking to read an overview, make sure you've got you know, the basics covered, I think that's what it does. That, that, that was its initial objective, to, to just be a map to the territory so that people can then go off exploring. Yeah, well, I think the book definitely does fill an important gap um, in addressing what you're talking about, uh, this gap between, you know, a yoga practitioner or teacher who's maybe just starting out and is is intellectually or spiritually curious in some of the, the deeper history and philosophical roots of yoga in India, but picking up a book maybe like Roots of Yoga by Mallinson and Singleton is a bit daunting or intimidating. Uh, well, exactly. No, I mean, that's that, to, to, to be totally honest, that's, that's, that's where it began for me. It was, uh, I got my copy of Roots of Yoga. In fact, that time we met in Boston, I'd just been with, with Jim and Mark at a, yeah. a, a launch they did in New York, and I'd been on stage and, and sort of hosted the evening for them. And yeah, it was great. They were talking really, you know, enthusiastically and openly in, in a way that really brought it all to life. And I remember, I mean, I'd found the book really engaging because I'd been exposed to a lot of the material in it while I was studying. And I was recommending it to people right, left and center. And they kept saying that they found it hard, hard work to read. Right. And I felt that was a real shame. And, and in the end, it is more of a reference book than a book people are going to read cover to cover unless, right. unless they're like me, a proper yoga nerd. Um, so I, I guess, you know, uh, I, I wanted to provide something that would, that would make it more likely that people would want to read a book like that. And over the years, I've also done, you know, I've hosted book clubs. So we, we ran one earlier this year on Roots of Yoga, where, you know, a, a, over a dozen weeks, we worked our way chapter by chapter through it. And uh, I think people gained the confidence to see that it isn't as daunting as they think. It just needs breaking down into smaller parts. So mm -hmm. you're just reading one part of the chapter and the relevant source material that goes with it and then making a little presentation to the group, then that's, you know, it's, it's really empowering for people and, and, and they start to see it is possible to engage with, but, you know, picking it up at first, as you say, it's a, it's a lot to take on if that's the first book you've opened other than a couple of, of you know, lighter titles, should we say. Definitely. And I think, you know, Roots of Yoga, it, it's a very specific type of book. As you said, it's, it's more of a reference work. Um, the intro chapters you know, in Roots of Yoga to the chapters on different methods or, you know, yogic ideas, asana, mudra, the yogic body, and so forth. They're incredible, dense, you know, snapshots of what we can say or could say at the time that this was written based on research at the time. Um, 
but the whole book itself doesn't kind of read as a you know beginning middle and end it doesn't have the same kind of narrative or you know chronology of kind of a, a of a of a history book or even you know a book like yours that really kind of goes from the earliest period you know early ancient yoga its roots and then kind of weaving together a narrative all the way to present day um so roots of yoga you know, as you're saying, I think for people who just don't have as much of a background, it's difficult. You're also, when you're reading the translations, you're, you're often missing the context of each of those larger texts and the traditions in which those texts, you know, um, are, are situated within. And so when you're just reading selections of, of, you know, descriptions of asana or pranayama from across all these different texts, well, that gives you something really specific and interesting to look at this thing thematically but it doesn't really give you a strong sense of what a particular text or tradition is is doing right so there's yeah, something exactly, also, yeah. there's something also lost in that so we just have to be aware of what what that book is and and how we're reading it but i but it's true when it's assigned for like a teacher training or something and like this is the primary text for for your history or philosophy section there is there's something um that might be lost there for, for, for students. So on the one end, if you have a kind of very scholarly book like that, on the other hand, in terms of more popular books on yoga that are more accessible by, by the public, there hasn't really been anything, let's be honest, that is really very good or that holds up based on the more recent research or evidence that we have about yoga. So again, you know, I, I, I congratulate you because I feel like uh, the timing is really right for this, but you've also done something really unique here in taking, you know, rigorous academic studies, something we can kind of hold our hat on, even though it's changing and updating uh, very quickly here. But you've taken sort of the state of the field. You obviously have a great command uh, of having read, you know, and been very aware and even on the ground with some of that research at SOAS. But then it really is a very readable book, uh, something that I think somebody without having to have too much background knowledge can kind of pick up and work their way through. And I think at the end of the day, if one read this book, they're not going to know everything, but they're going to have a really rich foundation for this and be able to I think to then kind of go deeper into any of these specific areas or texts or traditions, was that kind of your thinking as well? Well, thank you, Seth. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, that's, that was certainly my aspiration for writing it. And um, yeah, it's heartening, heartening to hear. And you know, I'm, I'm honored that you think that, to be honest, you know, obviously you're um, at the cutting edge of this field yourself. So, uh, you know, I guess my, my slight concern when, 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 when speaking to somebody, you know, who's, who's, who's in that position is that they'll see through it. Um, because, you know, in the end, it's, it's an overview, isn't it? And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it can only scratch the surface. So I've done my best to summarize things as effectively as possible. But as soon as we generalize or summarize, then there's always the possibility of seeing the exception or, you know, picking holes effectively and, and there's a value to that and of course that's 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 that's, that's how scholarly knowledge advances as, as you say the field doesn't stand still because everybody is you know in a very sort of collegial way um you know holding each other to account and uh so all i've really tried to do is to provide a window on some of the knowledge that's that's, that's come my way through that process um I mean, I start the acknowledgements by saying, you know, I couldn't have written it were it not for all these people doing this wonderful work. Um, and I guess I just had this slight fear that uh, some of that work wouldn't reach as wide an audience as as I would like it to. Um, and not to suggest that you know, I'm the only person who can make that happen by any stretch of the imagination. I just I just felt that that's where I could contribute. That's, that's the training I have. That's what I used to do. I used to be told at a moment's notice, go get a plane, go to some country where you don't speak the language and don't know anything, and somehow by tea time have something to tell the world, uh, which is a terrifying thing. And, and obviously, you know, it reveals the, the ludicrous nature <laughs> of the, the information systems that we rely on, because there's a lot of people who don't know that much, bluffing quite a lot. So in this case, you know, I'm not bluffing. I, I, I've done the hard work. I do know what I'm talking about. But at the same time, as soon as you get into that realm of trying to summarize as i say there are inevitable pitfalls so um as i say i'm i'm, I'm very happy that, that that you feel that way thank you 
What do you think about uh, what, what was behind the choice to to not use diacritics uh, for for the Sanskrit word? I'd be <laughs> curious to, to talk about that. I wonder is that something you felt strongly about? Or was it a conversation with publishers? This is something I'm honestly just all, often thinking about in terms of, as you say, you know, making things accessible, but also finding this balance between accessibility and kind of the integrity of the traditions, let us say, um, wanting to educate, but not sell short. Um, and for me, you know, I, diacritics is something, um, well, I'll just say, I feel strongly about you. <laughs> and, um, I, and I prefer to see them in publications because it helps to encourage better pro pronunciation, but also for people to be able to go and look upwards and without them, we often um, have all these variant spellings and, you know, words can kind of get more confused more easily. So I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm just opening a conversation about to use them or not pros and cons of those in a publication like this. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I don't think there's a right answer. And I weighed it up and uh, my, my gut was on the side of not using them because I think that they only make sense to people who've already got some knowledge of Sanskrit. And uh, I'm trying to reach here for the, here we are at the start of Roots of Yoga, where they've got a passage on diacritics and, and explaining how they work. Um, uh, in fact, this one doesn't actually say that much. It just says that they use diacritics. Uh, usually in, in, in a book, there's, there's a sort of description of, of how you pronounce all these little signs. And unless someone's actually already had some exposure to what to do with that, it's just more information that goes in one, one part of the brain and out of the other. So I really felt like what if, I'm, if, my, if my intention is to try and provide you know, a way in, um, if the, if the spelling is phonetic and simplified in a, as clear a way as possible, then hopefully people won't badly mispronounce words and, and that's a start. But I, I'm totally with you. I and mean, when I teach normally, I, all my slides, I use diacritics because yeah, I'm, I'm expecting that some people will A, have some knowledge already, uh, B, want to plug these words into a dictionary, especially online and look them up for themselves. And, and therefore they need the accurate spelling and there is a convention and they're representing sounds that we don't have in the English language. So if you start collapsing, you know, the, uh, the various uh, sibilants and, and, and into just SH, then, then you, you lose some nuance. Uh, they're, they're, they're different sounds made in different parts of the mouth. And, and obviously, you know, that's, that's lost. Um, but it just seems to me, it's, you know, it's, it's a question of priorities and ultimately, my priority was to try and you know remove as many obstacles to, to people mm -hmm. reading further as I possibly could. And the publisher had no 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 input in it at all. Mm -hmm. It was a decision I made very early on. But as as I went through the book, I kept reviewing it and thinking, I don't know about this because mm -hmm. as I say, when I'm teaching everywhere else, all my materials have, have <laughs> got them in. So I often find myself you know, going between whether it's slide decks are prepared for, for for a particular session on something and then chapters I wrote in the book and finding myself confounded by this, this disparity between the two. Um, right, it gets a bit tricky because you have to be all in one way or another. Exactly, exactly. And and and, and, and I'm generally all in for using diacritics. I just felt that this book in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fair fair enough, place, fair enough, Daniel. I'm not, again, I'm not <laughs> accusing you. I think, um, if again, if the, if the priority and the aim is to make it as accessible, as non-specialist as possible, then that totally makes sense. And having them might be another, you know, obstacle, antaraya, for your reader uh, and um, might put them off, frankly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if it's something that doesn't make sense to you, then the, the, the eyes glaze over and they jump forwards a little bit to try and find somewhere else that they can settle on that feels a bit more familiar. That's, that's, yeah. that's my only feeling. So you, you sounds like you were working on this for a few years, at least since I saw you in Boston. And, um, you know, what was what was the writing process like for this? Are you I imagine because you have this background as a as a journalist, you've maybe created the the writing uh, practice uh where you are you are you somebody who can kind of sit down and you say okay i'm gonna write such and such you know x amount of words in this day or this many hours every day um tell us a little bit about what the process was like i mean in its its own way it's 
I guess it is it is a practice writing it's um, you know you have to show up every day and do some and, and slowly things will change some days you go forward some, some, some days a good day involves you know deleting some words but um in the past I've, I've approached other projects a little bit more systematically um there was a book I wrote uh, you know getting on for 10 years ago now about my experiences as a journalist which involved me going to the British Library every day sitting there for five six hours uh, writing had a target of a thousand words each day and you know uh, uh, over a fairly short period of time three or four months I had a draft and I took a month off and then I did it again for another month month and a half or so and I'd edited it and then I had a book and then I couldn't find a publisher <laughs> and so I guess I was always mindful of that experience I mean I, I did in the end get it published but it took me a year to find a publisher for that and even in this case I'd, I'd finished a draft of this within six months of, 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 of when we met it wasn't a very good draft um, and there was <laughs> it needed a lot of work done to it but but I always had that sense of how much more time can I invest in this without being clear that it's ever going to see the light of day and uh, you know it's, it's it's a mixture of confidence but it's also a mixture of you know priorities and 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 what one needs to do with with, with, with one's time to make sure that you know all the other things like paying the bills happen so you know I was teaching and was busy with that so I would often work on it for a burst of time you know for a few weeks and then put it aside again so that's that's one of the reasons it took longer um and actually I mean it was it was completed I guess now it must be it's almost two years ago um and then mm -hmm. I, I I got it accepted by uh North Point Press Faris, Faris and Giroux 18 months ago and uh it's you know, that's that's the lead time in the modern game of publishing so over the last year and a half i've had this feeling of uh, I, I i hope it's still relevant but thankfully that you know being being you know, in, in the business of, of the very serious new york publishing we've been through several rounds of, of editing and mm. so i've had every opportunity to go back through i'm sure there'll be a few things i've missed but mm. uh it's, it's 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 been good to see that it stands up and also to have the chance to go back to it cold after six months and see a few things that need a bit more work or that just need removing <laughs> need, need updating in some cases as well so yeah so in terms of the content of the book again we said it's very ambitious it's it's wide ranging uh, in terms of its sources uh look, let's just say we're going from the vedas to vinyasa right um, <laughs> So I'm curious. Um, you have a course on that, Seth. <laughs> it's a good title. You no, know, there's actually there's another book if you haven't seen it. That's in I the genre. Seen that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seen that one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very short. Um, uh, actually, I haven't read it, so I can't really comment on it. Um, it's a but it's a great title. I like I like that title. Um, what I'm curious, you know, reading there's there's so much material that one needs to gain command of to uh to write such a book uh, or to do it well let's say um what were some of the biggest challenges like in terms of um what areas of yoga's history were were the most challenging for you to write question one and then two were there any surprises or like genuine things that you learned that you did not know prior to doing the research uh that that came out from this project that's an excellent question. I'll, I'll have to reflect on the, the second bit and go, go, go first to the first bit. Um, I think really, I mean, I should also explain that, you know, I, I, I teach these subjects at the Oxford Centre for Hindi Studies, the, uh, the history and philosophy of yoga. And so over the last four or five years now, you know, since I left SOAS, I've been immersing myself in this material as, as my day job. Um, obviously without the same structure that one has as a, as a you know, research student producing a, a piece of original work, which, which always takes one a, a little bit deeper and, and also you know, be, becomes more specialist in, in, in its focus. Um, I've instead been in this position of being a generalist, but at the same time, I have to deal with students from all over the world who ask me pretty probing questions. So a lot of my job is to, to, to uh, you know, respond to student queries on the spot. Um, and that's, shifted this year from being a, you know, a thing that's moderated over a forum to to being live online on zoom and, and yeah pe people put me on the spot so my yoga library has grown and uh, the, the amount of time I spend you know, furrowing through books in, in, in search of answers has is, is, is increased um, and that's part of how the book took shape in a way and I became clear very early on in, in, in doing that work for the OCHS which started in 2016 um, that uh, 
what I was doing is as, as, as a sort of facilitator of these conversations, which is very similar to what I was doing teaching you know, on yoga teacher training programs, was trying to provide succinct summaries of very complicated things that, that uh, you know, really deserved whole books, <laughs> and instead they were going to get distilled into 200 words. And I realized actually that that was of great value. Um, so I slowly went about trying to do that for all of the things that were on the tip of my tongue, and then over the course of time, had to expand and and for me the area that you know i just don't have as much knowledge of is is uh, the tantric traditions and uh, i've had the good fortune through my my time at the the oxford center for Indie studies to to attend some lectures by you know real experts gavin flood uh, alexis sanderson and mm -hmm. uh, through that have, have been able to to deepen my reading but uh, you know those those are things that i hadn't really studied for myself before i came into the world of yoga scholarship and I've always felt a little bit daunted by, I suppose, because they're vast. <laughs> and yeah, you, know, you look at roots of yoga, and uh, yeah, you know, well, well, to go back to what you were saying earlier, when there are these these extracts from texts we don't necessarily understand the context for. Mm -hmm. Often those are from tantric texts, where there are these practices that um, you know address some of the uh, the disciplines that have become part of yoga traditions, but they may be you know presented in other ways and as, as as part of a, a broader picture. That, you know is, is articulated as you go through the book and you can you can see how it all fits together but uh you know that was that was something before i read roots of yoga i realized i you know I, I'm, I'm pretty blind on to be honest i'm aware of the influence on hatha yoga from you know, tantric practices but uh i haven't read any of these texts originally for myself that was my original feeling so i spent time trying to do that you know obviously some of these these sources that, that have been you know texts that uh, have, have formed part of part of roots of yoga the translations of some of those tantric texts come from other scholars and uh you know their work is is available and having the good fortune to be near oxford i can go into the library and read it so i've tried to do that and uh, to try, you know, try try and get a better handle on it but there's only so much one can learn in the short space of time and i really am aware that that's you know thankfully i've <laughs> i've only really addressed tantra from the point of view of its influence on, on physical yoga practice but uh, obviously it's an ever-expanding field and, and over the last few years as, as jim mallinson has explained um, in his course for you i think uh, you know there's, there's a lot been discovered about these sort of uh, interactions between different tantric traditions even to the extent that you know, the idea of <laughs> His, his, his research has been turned on its head by discovering various Buddhist influences that uh, you know were, were not known to him some years ago when he was first setting out to really survey this field of early Hatha yoga texts. So you know there's, there's, there's a lot there and I'm sure there's more that, 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 that hasn't yet been uncovered or pieced together quite quite as it might be. So mm. I'm aware that that's, that's and, where I'm flying blind. And, and fair <laughs> enough. Um, I mean, the world of, of Tantra is incredibly vast and complex. And uh, we have a very, you know, oftentimes and in, in public perception, often like yoga itself with Tantra, a very simplified and, and uh, superficial understanding of what Tantra is as tantric sex or something. But anybody who's actually trying to understand you know, pre-modern Tantra in the Indian traditions, all one has to do is look at, you know, Alexis Sanderson's 1988 article that tried to map this out, at least in the in the world of Shaivism, Shaiva Tantra, Shaivism and the Tantric traditions. You, just to kind of get a sense of the complexity of the webs of different strands and streams of Shaiva Tantra and the sheer amount of literature and texts, um, very difficult to generalize what all of those different traditions are, are are seeking to do and how yoga fits into that. Um, it, it's indeed a, a really vast topic. So if you're not a specialist in that field, um, it, it it's definitely something that takes, I think, years and years actually to get a hold of uh, just even the terminology that those traditions are using. Absolutely. And I think, again, you know, I mean, that's one of these areas, a lot of people are interested in Tantra. I mean, it's got, you know, this, this, uh, this cachet in, in, in popular culture, um, and mm -hmm. also even, you know, in, in, in the yoga teacher world of, uh, there's, 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 there's something sexy about it in a different way. It, you know, somehow it's this, this idea of, uh, sort of, um, 
well, the, the, the particularly the non-dual flavor of it um, has, has 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 really inspired a lot of people to, to to see something you know very kind of accessible and and immediate and and uh, life affirming, I suppose. And so there are various distilled versions of that that have become quite popular. And yeah, you know, I've, I've seen I've, I've read some brutal reviews that Alexis Anderson has written of so, some some works that have, have tried to popularize things. And again, you know, I suppose that's why I felt like I really need to be on <laughs> really need to be on my best behavior with this material because uh, it's, uh, it's 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 tricky. And uh, a lot of things that we think we know, we don't necessarily know. And a lot of those texts are written in code anyway, and then they're not really designed to be the the manual that's all secret and told to you by the guru. In, in any case. Yeah. So were there anything that comes to mind? Um, we, and we can come back to it later or, or scrap it, but if, uh, was there anything that, that surprised you? Um, maybe whether it's something you thought you had a clear understanding about and you, something you realized, well, maybe that's a little bit different or, or just perhaps something, something new, uh, something, or something that, that clarified itself, uh, yeah. in the process of researching this book. There really, there really is something. And, you know, it's, it's a little awkward to talk about it in a way, cause, um, you know, I don't want to disparage any scholars in the process, but, um, please go, go ahead. <laughs> I do, I do feel, I mean, you know, this, this seminal text, Yoga Body, that brought both of us into, into the realm of, of, of studying yoga academically, uh, very influential, really, really, really eye opening and uh, very engaging. Um, and I guess it led me to, on a certain level, uh, this false conclusion that uh, you know, Mark Singleton is understandably irked that, that people jump to, that uh, there's something inherently inauthentic about modern yoga mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, yeah many of the fusions that created it uh, owed very little to Indian tradition. And his book does make it pretty hard not to jump to that conclusion. Let's, let's, let's put it that way. Um, and obviously, you know, that's, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about the context in which something took place. But uh, I guess I was, I was surprised to find myself falling back in love with modern postural yoga in a weird kind of a way mm. and, and wanting to articulate the ways in which there is some integrity to, to, to how some of those uh, inventions were put together. And uh, as I say, I, I don't in any way wish to, 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 to criticize what Mark did. I, I, I guess all I was really trying to say was that uh, I felt it was um, sometimes the case in, in scholarly writing about modern yoga that uh, the, the critical analysis leaves little space for, for celebration of, 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 of its, uh, its power. And a lot of the people who are doing the work <laughs> are practitioners. And it was really heartening to hear your conversation with Mark recently in which you, know, you talked about this and, and talked about his background as a yoga teacher. And you know, it's, it's, uh, again, I don't want to talk about what he, he was doing. It's more just having imbibed a lot of that worldview. No, I, think, I think what you're saying is, is important. I'm, um, yeah. So I'm glad uh, we're, we're going there. Everybody always tells me, you know, when I discuss this stuff with them, that, you know, I'm, I'm making them fall out of love with yoga. And, and I'm really trying to tell them that's not the aim, <laughs> for one. Um, and, and, and for two, the, you know, the, the ultimate authenticity is, is our relationship with what we do. And if we want it, a relationship with the tradition. But uh, it's not even compulsory to have that, although I do think it's you know, a question we should all raise for ourselves. If we're going to call what we do yoga, um, it ought to have some connection to other things that have been called yoga otherwise yeah, it's self-serving branding perhaps but um i think a lot of these you know, modern postural hybrids have that and uh it's always been interesting to me to try and articulate what those connection points are and I, i'm not sure i necessarily did that overtly in in the chapters i wrote about modern yoga but i think some of that came through um because one of the people who was kind enough to read an early copy and you know, pr pr provide, provide a comment on it, Anya Foxen, who's written a couple of books about modern yoga, commented on you know, it was part of an attempt to take modern yoga seriously. <laughs> and uh, I think that's really, you know, as, as a practitioner of modern postural yoga, who's found it enormously beneficial, um, I you know, feel it's important to encourage people to find their own connections to, to, to sources of authenticity, both within themselves and within the Indian traditions. And so I guess it was the conclusion that surprised me. I found myself having one um, mm. that admitted to myself and, and to anyone who reads the book that A, I'm not enlightened, <laughs> B, I don't know everything, 
and, and, and see that doesn't matter because it's all about you know trying to be honest with ourselves that's that's the whole point point of writing this book that's why it's got truth in the title i care passionately about truth and uh, that's why i stopped being a journalist in the context that i was felt was corrupted and it, 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 it's why i've done my best to to try and represent what other people have done as faithfully as i can in, you know, in a format that i hope is is accessible but you know, ultimately we've all got to do that for ourselves we've all got to engage with this material and come away with something that makes sense to us and that will involve reinterpreting things and it will involve you know um i guess ultimately reinventing things um and so long as we're honest about doing that that's totally okay the problems start to creep in when people sort of elide that and i guess you know coming full circle that's part of what you know, inspired Mark Singleton's work initially was, was, was trying to show some of the self-serving stories that have been told about the birth of these innovations uh, 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 as if they were actually continuations of ancient history weren't true. Um, and because the people who'd done that, like Krishnamacharya, weren't, weren't open about that process, although there are little hints scattered around his earth where it's, it's hard to miss, um, he, yeah, it, it has to be picked to pieces and um, and i guess you know as i say i, 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 I felt happy in, in myself and more able to present this to to teachers and students as i became clearer in the sense that there, there are ways in which one can find these these connections not only for oneself but in what those guys were doing and uh i suppose yeah again you know <laughs> I feel uncomfortable. I don't want. To, I don't want to suggest that there's something missing from what Mark did. It's just that uh, I do wonder if he if he if he was writing that book from scratch now, if it would look the same way. Uh, it's a fair question. I um I, I I sort of asked him, uh, maybe not as clearly as I could have. You know, what kind of things maybe hold up, or 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 would you change kind of with the onslaught really of research that's happened and taken place since then? And I, I don't think any book like that would 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 be the same. I think any scholar, um, just like any artist or painter or something like, you know, is going to continue to change their work as, as, you know, as, as one goes. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure you've experienced that with your book. I mean, every time you pull Absolutely. up that word doc, you're going to, you're going to continue to fidget with it, right. Until you just at some point say, okay, I'm done. And you're going to say, well, it's, 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 so someone has to wrench it out of your hands in the end. It's a bit like, you know, sort of with, with submitting a dissertation. If you, if you no. could sit on it forever, then, then it would, you'd, you'd, ne you'd no. never get your PhD. Deadlines, <laughs> deadlines are important. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, okay, to Mark's credit in the yoga body, you know, he does at several points, especially in the conclusion, say this study by showing this unique historical confluence and context of, of these global physical cultural forces by no means is meant to delegitimize the authenticity or even spiritual and religious power of modern Absolutely. yoga. He does say that. And he so I always want to point to that. Nonetheless, I do agree with you that regardless of however many times he says that. <laughs> Compare that to the line in the introduction he, where he says there's absolutely no connection between the Indian traditional Hatha yoga and, and modern expressions of postural yoga. So it's, right. And I think one, jar with one, another, one, that's two bits. one going through the journey of reading that book, if you're a yoga teacher who had certain conceptions about the antiquity, let's say, you know, or, or you know, uh, or where you know the connections to India of this practice. In many ways, for a lot of readers, those connections and those narratives are sort of severed by the end, and there is often a, a feeling of disenchantment that one goes through, and a kind of well, where do I turn next, and how, what am I doing? A re a re questioning. I think so many people have experienced that on, on many different levels. Um, it's a, it's one reason I'm excited not to plug Mark's online course, but we've got him coming on and it's going to be a way to really think with him about where he's at now with the work he's been doing since Yoga Body and what he's doing of kind of looking at yoga moving forward. Um, because I do think some of his views have changed. Some of them remain the same. Um, well, absolutely. And I, I think that came out in your conversation with him. That's the only reason I, I made the comment, you know, it would be, he, obviously, you know, he's, he's, he's defending his work quite rightly. So it's, it's, it's admirable. I mean, it's, 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 it's everybody ends up acknowledging, I mean, it's a really landmark piece of work that is unignorable. It's a cornerstone of modern yoga studies and, um, it's, it's stood the test of time. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's a, a PhD turned into a book that 
ordinary people read. <laughs> That's an achievement in itself. Um, but, it's, it's, but but what I'd like to say, though, and this kind of just gets back to to your book and your work, is that um, you know this. I think when one approaches the the history of yoga seriously in this manner, they can either come away feeling like you know, okay, I, everything I thought I knew is wrong. This kind of myth busters approach of like, you know, there's this debunking everything I thought was sacred and ancient and holy and this sort of thing. Uh, there is no truth of yoga, right? There is no single yoga tracing back to the Vedas, that sort of thing. I mean, I guess if somebody really had, you know, a very strong sense of that about the, the yoga that they were doing in it and in those connections, that can be very, um, uh, undergirding it can be it can be dismantling of their sense of self and practice but I think on the flip side another thing that happens often and in my experience when sharing the, this knowledge and teachings with people is that there's actually as you said there's actually uh, an infusing of joy and inspiration there's kind of an empowerment with studying this history because you realize actually yoga is so much more multifaceted and plural and there's so much more room, actually, for innovation and absolutely, absolutely. expressions of yoga to come through. But my question for you, though, is there's also because I think there's also some danger in that, in that relativism of yoga. <laughs> so my question to you, then, is, you know, if somebody reads this book, The Truth of Yoga, and they say, well, Daniel, you say there is no truth of yoga. Yoga has been so many things, anything under the sun. So whatever I want, I can just call it yoga. Anything can be yoga. Um, what well, I do actually say at one point, you know, it, it, things don't become yoga just because somebody says that they are. Um, and, but sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> no, I, I was done. I, just to put it to you, you know, what what is your? I'm sure you get those questions when you're when you're teaching at, at Oxford or in teacher trainings. What what is kind of your response when people say, well? then, you know, if there's no truth to yoga, um, you know, then, then I can just do whatever I want and I can call anything yoga. Um, you know, kind of how, do, how do you respond to, to students like that? Um, well, I, I, I think, as I say, there's, there, there are clear common factors. Uh, if we're talking about physical practice traditions, um, you know, starting at the very beginning, uh, you know, yoga was articulated as a, as a meditation practice. Um, uh, turning inward um, and focusing inward. So concentration and internalization just seem to be consistently themes in, in the way that yoga is presented in early texts. And unless something is, is, is really geared in that direction, I don't know how much it has to do with yoga tradition, if I'm entirely honest. And uh, so one can question if a lot of things currently presented today are facilitating that. I mean, some people find it, you know, very grounding and internalizing to be able to tune out of their mind and into a music soundtrack. Um, I personally don't find that, but you know, that's not to say that the play, playing of music is inherently unyogic. I mean, it's, it's impossible to actually come up with this, this sort of where the line is. But I think we are all able to see for ourselves that there has to be a line somewhere that not everything can count as yoga. Um, and in the end. What really matters, I think, is less about pointing the finger at other people and saying, well, they're not doing yoga. It's more about you know, having an honest relationship with ourselves about what we're doing. Just as to why are we calling it yoga? What is yoga? What is yoga for me? What, what, why, why am I interested in this stuff? Uh, why am I not interested in you know, running on the treadmill or, 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 or drinking 10 beers? You know, what is it that I'm actually trying to do here? Uh, and so there is some process of, 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 of cultivating stillness um, through some way of disengaging with you know, this, this flurry of information through the mind and the senses that doesn't necessarily mean disengaging from life. And obviously that's, that's really where we're on to, you know, the, 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 the open territory, I suppose. This is why I always wanted to study academically, but it's not really academic study. It's, it, it's theology at uh, this stage. Um, it's to try and say, you know, what does all this mean in the 21st century when, when, when we're not renunciates? Uh, there aren't many yoga texts that do what the Bhagavad Gita does and, and starts talking about you know, living in the world and being socially engaged and doing just a little bit of this stuff to top up on the ability to act with less attachment. And so if that's what most people are, are turning to yoga practice for in the 21st century, just to, to, to tune out a little bit, 
um, is there perhaps some new configuration of, of you know a, another sort of yoga Upanishad for the 21st century that still needs to be written um, and, and I often feel that there is but I've come more to the conclusion that we all have to write our own and so I guess that's all I'm really building up to is that that, that question is for each of us a very personal one I think and it, it's, it's not really possible to generalize. Well, it sounds like you've got your next book project. <laughs> Maybe. You heard, you, you heard it here first, right, on the Yogic Study podcast. Yoga Upanishad for the 21st century. It is, it is interesting. It is interesting to think, though, about, you know, if, we, if we're honest about the history, and it's one of constant evolution and innovation and adaptation, um, and we can, we can put in brackets traditional yoga if it's sort of within an Indian context and maybe even pre-colonial and these sort of things. But when, where, where do those lines, you know, end? At, at what point does yogic innovation become non-traditional? And uh, those, are, those are subtle and open-ended questions, I think, uh, because yoga is changing in, in radical ways uh, today. Well, absolutely. Some of those things that, that that Mark discussed in your podcast, and that will be obviously a feature of his course, talking about you know technology and uh, if you can just push a button to silence your mind, is that yoga or is, is is that some sort of you know full frontal lobotomy by digital means? Um, it's it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think there's something about this this sort of engagement with ourselves that's that's fundamental to, to how yoga has been expressed and, and the way we relate to the world through ourselves and that goes really back to the earliest Upanishads and whether or not it's been called yoga uh, it's, it's 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 informed most expressions of yoga that have identified themselves as such and uh you know, there's, there's there's new ways in which people are seeking to do that and and uh, where where it goes from here is kind of up to us and i suppose that's that's really why i wrote the book is to say you know if you're engaged with yoga in the 21st century and you're freestyling as we're all inevitably going to to a certain extent um, it helps to have some idea of what's gone before and if you're interested in trying to align in some way with previous tradition then you know, here's, here's here's a whole bunch of thematic material that you might dip into and see how to do that and also to, to see see ways in which that's being misrepresented right now being distorted out of all meaning and so you know obviously there, are, there there's enormous value as a coming back to in, in this critical project of, of, of pointing out where things uh, don't add up and um, I guess all I was really building up to saying when talking about yoga body and, and, and there's how things have moved on is, 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 is just you know with with, with, with sort of a, a bigger picture perspective sometimes can see that you know, many things can be contained within this definition of yoga um, and as Mark wrote in one of his other updates to this introduction he wrote to a Serbian translation um, it both doesn't mean that you know yoga is nowhere uh, because there are all these distinctions or that anything can be yoga because somebody decides it is um, there is a tradition uh, it may take many different forms but it seems clear that some things fall outside of it and the one example I often reach for is uh, you know for me certainly in my idea of how it would be of any benefit uh, beer yoga uh, I like beer um, I'm not very good at drinking it anymore I don't have much tolerance for it uh, certainly having a couple of beers and then trying to do something involving inward focused concentration not so likely to happen having a laugh maybe <laughs> But I wouldn't say having fun and drinking beer is yoga. Um, you know, yoga is something else, I think. So having that as an adjunct to practicing yoga doesn't seem to me to have a great deal to do with the yoga tradition. And then again, you can go and find a bunch of Bengali tantrics getting smashed out of their skulls sitting around a fire. So I, think I have no idea what to say in some ways. It's, it's very hard to draw that line, but I think right. it's an important question to ask ourselves. That's right. I'm thinking of Sufi poets and their... And their um and their wine, you know, the, the oh. Chinese poets and their, Absolutely. And, and their alcohol. And, we, and to come back to where we started with my own slightly sort of awkward admission to having enjoyed chuffing on the hash pipe a little too much at one stage in my life, you know, so that's there, that's part of the yoga tradition. It's, it's, that reminds me of uh, David Gordon White's opening in um, one of his books. Uh, I can't remember if it's Alchemical Body, but uh, he says something like, you know, I want to thank the knots, the knot yogis that I interviewed for their for their time, their wisdom, and their chillums, usually <laughs> in, usually in that order or something like that. 
Yeah, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I think I guess uh, to come back to where we started, I think that was the problem. I I, I sort of thought it was the other way around. Um, I had some idea that uh, if I could just sit around and get high enough, I might get enlightened. Whereas uh, I realized with hindsight that was it, was it wasn't working that way for me, at least. <laughs> Well, Daniel, I thank you for your time, your wisdom, and your microphone today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Seth. It's been a pleasure to chat. It's been a pleasure. Um, where can folks find you? Uh, where can they find the book? Ah, yeah. Uh, well, the book will be on sale everywhere. Um, you can find uh, a website devoted to it uh, at truthofyoga.com. Um, and uh, I also teach um, online courses at the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies. Uh, you can find them at ochsonline.org. And then there's my website, danielsimpson.info, where I also host other online you know, gatherings, workshops, courses as well. So, and do you anywhere. have anything coming up uh, you'd like to promote? Well, I'll be putting together a course to accompany the book, uh, which I'll be announcing uh, you know, in a few weeks time, hopefully, if it, if it all comes together as planned, um, just to try and, yeah, I guess, put it all into a bit of a broader context. So, uh, yeah, if anyone's interested in that, uh, you can either sign up for my newsletter or follow me on social media and you'll find those links on my website. Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, again, congrats on the book. Um, thank you, and uh, look forward to being in touch. Likewise, yeah, and wish you all the best and uh, a happier 2021 for us all. Yes, let's hope so. All right, take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Yogic Studies podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or sharing this episode with someone else. Thanks so much, everyone. Until next time, please take care.